Hey everybody, Quantum back here, and in this video we're going to be taking a look at some gameplay using the Emerald Steel Robin Hood theme deck that I did a deck profile on prior to this video, link in the description for that if you haven't seen that. It gives you some insight into how we built this deck and some of the decisions that we've made. Uh, so we are going to be playing a best of three here. My friend is on an Amber Ruby location based deck, so kind of interesting, uh, similar to what Talman Purple played with obviously some Shimmering Skies upgrades, so if you are wondering how that deck may adapt into the new meta, you'll be able to see it in action here on my friend's side. Uh, but on the play here, we're going to be able to drop a 1-drop Robin Hood, and our opening hand here looks pretty decent. We do have a 1-drop Diablo, as well as a 2-drop Robin Hood and a Baboom, so a lot of potential turn 2 plays depending on what we want to do. The opponent opts to drop a Neverland, a 1-drop location, uh, so they reveal that they're on Amber there for sure. Uh, we're going to decide not to take out the location with the Baboom and Robin Hood, but instead opt to ink uh, the Emerald 5 cost Robin Hood, Sneaky Sleuth, in order to, on here you can see me trying to utilize the drag and uh, rotate function, failing a little bit there, but anyways, we're going to drop that in order to play out the 2 drop Robin Hood, which will not have the ability proc since the opponent has no characters that are damaged, so you can argue, you know, do I want to waste this Robin Hood here? Um, but I didn't really mind, I just want to develop some characters on board. We put 2 damage into the Neverland, uh, opting to save my Baboom for a character potentially, but the opponent punishes me for not taking out the location and playing out that Felix, which allows them to draw a card if they have a location in play. So on the draw here, we're going to go ahead and ink the Diablo in order to shift Robin Hood. I don't think it matters which one you shift on unless you really care about stuff getting bounced back to your hand, in which case shifting on the Emerald Robin Hood would probably be better since you get that one back to hand if you are worried about Robin Hood's getting bounced. Uh, but in this matchup, we know the opponent is on Ruby Amber, so things are just going to get removed and not bounced, so that's okay. Now the opponent, uh, with a very healthy hand here, has a couple of options most likely. I know that they are playing the Shift Felix, because there's no real reason to play the small one without the big one. And the new Shift Felix does give locations plus 2 willpower, which makes stuff like RLS Legacy have 10 health, which is pretty interesting. There you can see me flipping around the Felix in order to read it. So the Inky Taffeta, I think is her name? Taffeta? Uh, the one that allows you to gain 2 lore whenever you move her to a location. They're going to go ahead and shift the Felix just to get a you know decent sized body on board. This is a 3 shift, but a 4-5 body. Thankfully, we top deck into a Zeus here, um, and it looks like not playing out that Baboom or you know keeping it for ink paid off a little bit, you know because we wanted to keep the Robin Hood or develop the character instead. So I was thinking, I guess in that scenario, my opponent getting one lore doesn't really matter. I really wasn't putting them on this Felix card to get a card draw, otherwise I probably would have boomed the location. But it ends up working out okay because we're able to get tremendous value right in taking out that Felix with the uh, Alon Came Zeus. So the opponent's entire board gets wiped, but they still have a lot of cards in hand. They ink a Jim Hawkins and just pass turn on nothing. Not great for them, so yeah, their hand was kind of underwhelming, uh, unfortunately. They probably have a couple of plays, but nothing worth playing out at this point, uh, given what our board state is. So we're just going to go ahead and continue to develop a Beast Tragic Hero, uh, quest for 3, go up to 8, and pass. So we're definitely putting the pressure on the opponent. If they are on Be Prepared, since you know they're on Amber, or Ruby, sorry, we are still a couple of turns away. They only now hit 5 ink, right? And this is, again, the advantage of being on the play. Uh, once again, just dropping something I wasn't really expecting, but it works out fine because the Robin Hood being banished allows me to draw a card. And they do have 2 damage on their Maui now, which means we can sing off of Let the Storm Rage On, uh, or just hard cast it and draw a card as well to finish off that Maui. So there I drew 3 cards, one for the Robin Hood being banished, one for Beast Tragic Hero, and then one for Turn. So this is what I was talking about in the, in the deck profile, saying that uh, you know when your hand size starts to get low, or you just got a couple of uninkables, you definitely need card draw in this deck. Uh, Emerald Steel, as we know from the Bucky meta, was very good at using Diablo and Beast Tragic Hero in order to draw cards, and then they would lock up that card draw, or you know secure that card draw, preventing you from threatening the Beast Tragic Hero and Diablos by discarding your hand, right? Well, we don't discard hands, but at least we're going to be able to um, put a lot of pressure on, and just deal with board states consistently because, you know, just hard, you know, hard casting out songs, singing songs, dealing with boards um, is enough to kind of keep the opponent at bay. 
So I make a little bit of a mistake in playing the Diablo last. If I was going to play it out, I should have played it out first because I could have quested with the beast potentially in order to get an extra little bit of lore since I just saw the opponent was not on a Maui. However, I think not questing with the beast here is still the correct play because if they would have top decked into a Maui, it just isn't worth it. I'm already ahead in lore and I, I have much more, I much value. Uh, I value much more the card advantage that Beast gives me. Here you see me miss, speaking of which, the Beast draw. I only draw one for turn, um, so that's unfortunate. I'm going to shift the Robin Hood. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Just trying to be a little cheeky, maybe. Just uh, This is not an optimal play by any means. First of all, because I didn't draw the extra card, which could have been an inkable. I'm going to end up singing Let the Storm Rage on to deal two damage to... <laughs> like why uh to the jim hawkins uh drawn to a tinkerbell which i'm going to ink in order to play out the second let the storm rage on but i guess we're going to quest with the robin hood first to get two lore since it gets plus one uh as per damage character my opponent has and they now have one in that jim hawkins so we leave the location on board uh but again we're so far ahead at this point uh we quest with everything else 13 to, to 2 now uh we're feeling okay the, the be prepared potentially is still um two turns away the opponent is only going to be on six ink if they choose ink for this turn uh they end up playing out the taffeta and then moving it gaining two lore but this is sort of the issue with these kind of gimmicky cards you know and i play a couple of them myself is that it doesn't do enough to help you deal with the opposing board state like yes it's nice to gain that lore but it's like is it really doing anything to progress your game state in this instance no right whereas if they would have had a removal spell or something uh, it would have done a lot more for them so here we're just going to be able to uh, quest and then play out double Diablo. Oh no, sorry, we double challenge the location. So we take out the location um, and then we're going to opt to quest with the Robin Hood, go to 14, leave the Beast Tragic Hero up. And yeah, we have more than enough to threaten lethal next turn. So I'm just uh, organizing things. My opponent draws and I think they realize that uh, there's not much they can do because even this Tuck Tuck giving plus two um, taking out the Robin Hood or trading with the Robin Hood, we still have six lore on board, which is game next turn regardless. And we have a board. I mean, if they put had be prepared, we would potentially be in a little bit of trouble. Um, but we're so close to winning the game, and the be prepared is still one turn away, even if they were able to ink, which they opted not to. So they scoop, and we move on to game number two. So in this best of three for game number two, we're going to be on the draw. We're going to aim to put back our higher cost cards, opting to keep the champion of Sherwood because it is the better shift target on three if we do indeed draw into a one drop Robin Hood or a two drop one, which we do, thankfully. The opponent on turn one opts to develop a Daisy Duck, which is a very strong play as we know. It's going to be able to get them a lot of lore very quickly if we can't deal with it. Thankfully, we do have the one-two punch in the Robin Hood into the Baboom. I talked about this in the deck profile video that we made, uh, also linked in the description, by the way. On turn two, though, the opponent is going to develop yet another Daisy Duck and quest with the first one. Unfortunately, we miss the trigger. We play 42 characters, but we reveal a Let the Storm Rage on, which is actually really good for the opponent there because... We do have the Ursula Deceiver of All in our hand, and the more songs that we can sing with that, the more advantage and more tempo we'll be able to claw back in order to take control of the game, because for these more casual decks, I definitely think it's harder for you to win on the draw than on the play, simply because they don't play the most meta-relevant lines in order to sweep uh, switch tempo. That's one of the reasons why in the deck profile video I mentioned you could opt to cut the Diablo line, one, because it's very expensive, but also because a whole new world being sung on turn three with like a shift Robin Hood is a potential tempo disruptor that can help you gain advantage when you're on the draw. Anyways, uh, we do end up taking, taking care of one Daisy Duck by throwing Robin Hood and uh, the Baboom into it. And the opponent knows that, you know, on three, we could potentially shift Robin Hood or have another Baboom. So they just opt to take out my Robin Hood with their Daisy. And I make a you know, I don't know if I, I don't I don't know if I call it a misplay, but I definitely should have read that, you know, next turn was going to be a Rapunzel drop which will allow them to heal the Daisy Duck, right? Because why would you sacrifice two quest to outer Robin Hood? It's just more value to quest, I think, right? And force me to do the interaction to, to crash into the Daisy. So I should have definitely seen that the, um, the Rapunzel was coming. So it gets them a draw two, which is really bad for me because anytime a Rapunzel resolves, you are just so far behind. The quest from Daisy again reveals another song in a Strength of the Raging Fire, unfortunately. So another good one that we could have sung with the Ursula Deceiver of All. Uh, and it goes to the bottom of the deck there. So we just get no card advantage off this Daisy. It is questing for free. We're going to be able to double sing the Let the Storm Rage on that we had in our opening hand, though, with the Ursula netting two cards. And here I'm just thinking about how I want to distribute the damage. Because I have a couple lines of play, 
I could go two damage each and then use Robin Hood's bow to finish off the Tuk Tuk, but then I let the Daisy Duck live and they have four questing pressure on board. They're already on five, which means they go to nine, so that's not ideal. Um, I just end up putting the, well, I draw first for the first resolve and then I let the, uh, or let the draw dictate what I do. And I, end, I do end up putting the two damage on the Daisy Duck. But I could have also done like two damage each and left the Tuk Tuk with two damage and then boom the Daisy to finish it off. But my goal was seeing if I could have outed the Tuk Tuk because I do want to develop this Diablo, which I do here, um, and not have it be threatened by that Tuk Tuk because it does have evasive, right? And which it, it does absolutely destroy the Diablo being a 2 3 body and Diablo being a 2 2. Thankfully, they do end up crashing the Tuk Tuk into the Ursula Deceiver of all. And then they drop Super Goof, which I think is a super underrated card. Uh, you know, imagine playing the rest of the game when you, your opponent's at 18 and you're just afraid to turn anything sideways because a Super Goof comes down and wins the game. Sounds kind of goat level broken to me, right? Um, you know, your opponent just basically can't exert anything, which means you're going to win the game regardless. But maybe it's just a win more card in that, in that sense. Just the threat of it being there. Um, but I think what ended up happening here... Um, yeah, I, I just I just don't have an ideal way to clear the whole board, but I have to do my best to slow them down. So we're gonna opt to baboom the goofy here, and then use the three ink in order to play out a Robin's bow, which will finish off the tuck tuck since it's already damaged, and then we quest with the Diablo. So again, not ideal lines of play, um, but it's the best we could do. The Rapunzel ends up living. They're already on nine lore, which means they're gonna be able to quest to eleven. On their draw for turn, we draw as well. Uh, they drop a River Styx, the Underworld location, which is going to gain them one lore a turn. And if they are able to get three ink available when they quest with the character there, which they just put Rapunzel on, they're going to be able to recur anything from their discard pile. The recursion in Amber is you know, very, very strong and, and really overlooked, I think. Definitely um, interesting to see like revive and stuff coming to the game, which I think, and my friend proves in, in one of these matches, how good it can be. Anyways, they pass back to us. We're going to draw a Grab Your Swords. So we have a couple of potential lines of play once again. This strength is not really going to be doing anything, obviously, at this point in time. Do we want to ink it? I don't think so because it's one of our ways to prevent the opponent from going for game a little bit later because they're very close to getting to that point where we really have to worry about any little bit of lore that they can potentially generate. So we just opt to play out the Robin Hood on 5 and then use Diablo to hit the location and then use Robin's bow to deal another damage, putting three damage total on the underworld, which means the Rapunzel can now quest and pay three to recur a, a character from the discard, which is really bad. They draw for turn, we draw off the Diablo, I think there, and they're gonna opt to start things off with a Fix-It Felix to draw a card since they have a location in play. And they could potentially shift uh, another uh, the shift Felix for three if they wanted to, which means this River Sticks would have eight willpower, which would definitely be very difficult to out. Uh, they do an even better play though, knowing that the Rapunzel that they just inked there doesn't really represent too much value now because they're very close to closing out the game. So they just drop an RLS Legacy already on 14 lore. We're definitely not going to have an answer to the characters and locations that the opponent has on board. So we are really behind the eight ball now. Um, I have a couple lines of play in this particular uh, situation that I'm really starting to think through because I really wanted to avoid just making hasty decisions and making mass misplays. Let me know, by the way, if you made it this far, if you think I've made any bad calls or bad plays or misplays because I would be interested to see if there was a way that I could potentially have clawed back into this game. But uh, Ruby Amber is just so strong on the play. It is really one of the hallmarks of the deck. It does struggle on the draw, but on the play, it is just very, very strong. Um, but I, I have a line basically where I can clear the characters, which I think are more of a threat because obviously the Rapunzel is already at the Underworld and, and they could potentially use the entire utility of the discard pile, which is a problem. They have a Fix-It Felix, which is a potential shift problem because if I, I leave those characters up, I can't out both the locations, which means one of the locations that survives, which is likely the RLS Legacy, will be on 10 willpower if they do have the shift Felix. So I just have to deal with the characters and that's what I'm really mulling over. If there is a more optimal way to out both the either like a location and the two characters or if i just have to go for the two characters um but in an effort to save time here because i've already wasted a lot of time and you know i felt bad for my opponent uh i just end up making a decision to hard cast the grab your swords which will deal two damage to both of the characters obviously 
and then now I can use um, the Robin Hood to take out the Rapunzel and I forget to gain my lore off of this or do I gain the lore? I don't know. But we can use the Robin's bow at least to take out the Felix now that the Felix is damaged. So that's the third damage point on Felix. So that stops the shift. And then Robin Hood takes out the Rapunzel. Okay, and we do gain the lore. That's good. Very easy thing to forget. And then the Diablo is just going to hit the location for two more damage. If the Robin's bow was triggering any time a Robin Hood was exerted, it would have been much better, I think. But it's only on quest because then I could have finished off this location. Either way, the opponent is going to be able to go to 17 lore here. And now it's just a matter of time before they close it out. You're going to see just a really nice thing that the opponent is able to do here. Uh, so they're going to end up paying 5 for a Maui to take out the Robin Hood, which really throws off my game plan and being able to deal with their board. But they're going to get to 19 anyways because of the um, RLS Legacy. I missed the draw for the Diablo there because I was obviously zoomed into the opponent's board and not my own control. So I just draw two, one for the Diablo, one for the Robin Hood being outed. Now I draw for turn. If you were wondering what that sequence was there. Um, but yeah, there's nothing we can do at this point. The, they move the Maui to the, um, what do you call it? Jeez. The Underworld, River Styx. But it doesn't really matter. Like they're gonna, this RLS Legacy is going to live so it's going to get them to 19 and then at that point the super goof will be able to win them the game they already have one in the discard so they could revive it off of this river sticks if i don't out it this turn or if they play revive they could also just revive the goofy um, and i have to play around you know exerting any characters for the rest of the game all right like that's the power of the super goof card is crazy good guys i'm telling you it's i think it's really really slept on right now Anyways, yeah, I'm just thinking, like, what's the best way for me to survive? I don't think there's really anything I can do. So I start off by using the Robin's Bow to finish off the River Stick, since it had 5 damage on it. Um, and now I think I just opt to... Because the Maui isn't threatening lore, right? So I think I opt to develop a Beast Tragic Hero. I don't know what I'm going to hopefully draw into that's going to get me back into this game, but not much. We ink the 2-drop Robin Hood, and then we use all 8 ink to drop Ursula and Beast Tragic Hero. Uh, and then Diablo will take two, put two damage into the RLS and pass. So my opponent has an interesting line of play here. So we draw off the Diablo. They could move the Maui to the RLS and take out my Diablo if they wanted to, right? Because Maui would get evasive. Here I make a misplay because I'm zoomed into the opponent's board. They revive Rapunzel, which is like one of the most powerful interactions you could do with a revive. Draw three off healing the Maui and I forget to draw three off the Diablo here doesn't really matter like I'm already losing this game to be honest so I just wanted to see what the opponent was going to cook being on 19 2 they could have revived super goof and then moved super goof to the location and then just challenge the Diablo and win the game that way too so my opponent had a couple of different things to do and they could have played tuk tuk move the Maui to the location and then use the Maui to out the the, the uh, Diablo as well so they had like a couple of different lines but again it doesn't really matter because at this point the game is over uh, I can't deal with the characters and the location or actually can I again it's like a mute point like the opponent's on 19 there's nothing I can do here right this is why we need more like lore drain in the game because once you get to this point you just know the game is over right there's like there's no recourse there's no way to stop to slow the opponent down right like in magic at least you have ways to heal damage right so if your life is low you you have healing in the game I think lore drain should have been one of the key mechanics that was first brought to the game um over discard in my opinion because as, as we know discard is not great to play against to the point where they errated Bucky, just like I called it at the beginning of you know the discard era, basically with Rise of the Floodborne. Anyways, we're gonna opt to double drop Diablo here, just trying to do any last gasp for air in this match, and then with the Ursula Deceiver, we're gonna sing, double sing uh, Strength of a Raging Fire here, which is gonna take out both of the threats at the RLS in the Rapunzel and the Tuk Tuk, dealing five damage to both. We're going to be able to throw everything else into the RLS, dealing exactly 6 damage between the Beast Tragic dealing 3, the Bow dealing 1, and the Diablo dealing 2. But it doesn't matter because, like I said, as soon as, the as soon as I have an Exerted character on board, the opponent already had the Super Goof in hand, and that just wins them the game anyways. On to game number 3, where we, where we'll, we will be on the play for the final game. So for game number three here, we're going to look to try to be the aggressor, obviously, now being on the play once again. Knowing that the opponent will likely develop a Daisy Duck, we need to hopefully also draw into a Baboom. 
And this is again why I focus so much on aggro in that deck profile. Some of you might have said quantum, like why do you keep going over how threatening aggro is? Like not every deck in the meta is going to be aggro. No, but if there are a lot of amber decks, guess what? They're all going to be playing that daisy duck, or at least they should be, right? Whether or not they're full on aggro or not, you can see the work that this daisy duck with a location deck was able to do, right? Get a lot of lore early, finish the game off with locations. And we all thought, myself included, locations were kind of out of the meta, right? With the Kuzco, with the Simba, etc. And you could argue we could fit Simba into this deck, but it's just not fitting the theme, right? Anyways, on turn one, we do get the pretty strong play in opening with Robin Hood. We do have a morph, even though we inked one there, and we have another Robin Hood. As expected, the opponent does have the Daisy Duck, and hopefully we're not unlucky with these Daisy Duck triggers, and we're actually able to get some card advantage off of that OP questing power. So on turn two, we're going to opt to play the one drop Diablo just to take a peek at the opponent's hand here. Okay, a decent hand, double Daisy Duck, Goofy, Jim into RLS, and a Rapunzel. So they've got all the tools needed to really swing tempo, in my opinion. Again, being a more casual deck, it's not as powerful as like, you know, Sing a Whole New World or anything on, on Amber Steel Song, but the Jim Hawkins into a location is very, very strong. On turn two, they're going to play, didn't they do this on game two? Double Daisy Duck, <laughs> too? Um, but it's pretty strong. However, you can see the difference of being on the play versus on the draw. With the double Daisy Duck developed, they know that this Diablo plus this Robin Hood represents four damage if I have the shift Champion of Sherwood. And they would give me card advantage, they would get two lore, but then their Daisy Duck gets instantly outed if I uh, if I did have the shift line. Um, and then my Champion of Sherwood just checks the aggro threats from here on out until they're able to develop the locations, which at that point, I probably am too far ahead with, with the game. So knowing that my opponent uh, is waiting for that and I want them to quest with these daisies, I want the card advantage, uh, we end up inking the Champion of Sherwood in order to play out the Ursula Deceiver of All, banking everything on the double sing of Let the Storm Rage On. The opponent top decks it just in time, and the Towel Man combo, as I call it, comes through in full effect. On turn three, a Jim Hawkins into an RLS Legacy. However, I think they opted to still not, yeah, they didn't quest with the Daisy Ducks. Um, so the double sing of the Ursula here, and again, the power of being on the play allows me to facilitate these kind of lines. We double damage the gem to get it off the RLS. And yes, we still have to deal with the RLS legacy, but we're in a much better position to do so now because we have a Zeus that we drew off of that Let the Storm Rage on. So I'm just going to probably throw two damage. No, I quest. Okay, that's interesting. I definitely should have thrown four damage into the RLS legacy. Again, being on tabletop, I'm like not looking at the opponent's board, so <laughs> I'm like, yeah, let me just quest. Definitely should have thrown uh, the characters into the RLS there. Uh, the opponent gains two off RLS. They're going to go ahead and I didn't even see what that was, a Felix that they inked. And then on four, drop a Goofy uh, and take out the Ursula Deceiver of All with the Goofy and the Daisy Duck. I did draw off the Diablo, and some of you might be asking, well, Quantum, you know they had these cards, right? Because I, I played the Diablo and saw their hand. Well, it's a much different scenario now if they were Punzel Heal, because I have Diablo on board. Thankfully, by the way, if you didn't see it, the quest with the second Daisy revealed the Beast Tragic Cure, which I was able to get to hand. And I actually want them to draw with Rapunzel, because then I draw too. And I have bigger impact cards at this point, um, at least in the opening parts of this game, until they maybe get up to be prepared range. Because my steel songs, like Zeus that I have in my hand here, Baboom, which is an action, they will deal with the locations, right? And I have characters that can deal with the location. So if I can get enough advantage, it doesn't matter if they be prepared me. Because it's going to cost them tempo and I'm going to be able to reestablish my board if I have enough card advantage. Um, if they're even on be prepared. Now again, I think I mentioned this earlier, but maybe not. My opponent actually forgot to put brawls in their list. Whether I think I don't know if it was intentional by him or not, but I think after this match, you definitely realize if you were, if you are going to play Ruby Amber, uh, you definitely need at least Brawl and or Teeth and Ambitions because the threat of Diablo is still very real. So here I'm just thinking about what the best way to clear the board is because obviously you can tell right in this game state I have a couple of different options. Let me know what you would do in this situation. You know, barring that you made the same misplay as me and didn't challenge the RLS when you could have instead of questing for four uh, or for two, sorry, to go to four. Um, yeah, dealing with the location there is definitely what you had to do. Like, I cannot leave that location up. It's just too powerful. If, and, and because I know already now, being in game three, that they play the Felix, that gives it plus two willpower. It could be really detrimental in leaving that on board where it just becomes harder and harder to out. 
Um, but with the Chief Bogle on board here, I'm going to be able to potentially deal some heavy damage. So we're going to exert 5, play Beast Tragic Hero to deal 1 damage to everything. Okay. Use Diablo to take out the 3 damaged Daisy. Which means we get 1 damage on our Diablo. Trying to get the damage counter over there. And then use Bogo to take out the Goofy. And this puts my opponent into, I want you to use your Daisy Duck to challenge and then use Rapunzel to heal. We use Robin Hood there. Yeah, see, see what I mean? Like I use Robin Hood to challenge the RLS in this scenario where like I could have done that last turn as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm putting my opponent in a very awkward position. Only on two cards where we have the Diablo draw going. Uh, they need cards. So they end up throwing Daisy into the Chief Bogo putting the damage on Bogo to three. And then they spend four for the Rapunzel. And this time I don't forget the trigger. We're able to draw three and look at that. We just we just draw really, really well. One of the four Tinkerbells, I think for the first time in this, no, 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 we definitely drew a Tinkerbell and we inked it in another, in, in another game. But the Tinkerbell with the Bogo now is going to represent two damage on play, which is actually, you know, not as strong as you would think in this particular matchup, but normally would be really strong. So our turn comes now and we draw two off Beast Tragic Hero. And just like that, this is why, like I talked about in the deck list, you need these draw engines still. We know how strong these are, right, from the Bucky meta prior to the errata. And you're basically just adapting it to Robin Hood now. So, you know, while I do call this deck a casual deck, you can see when it gets its engine going, it can be very tough to deal with. Um, and this is the one of the decks that definitely will check aggro, just like it did when, you know, these this ping strategy first came out in Rise of the Floodborne with Beast Relentless. Um, but yeah, we're just thinking through here what the best line of play is to wipe the board because I think I can clear everything. The opponent is ahead on lore, but very behind in card advantage. And again, being on the play, the opponent constantly has to deal with, we are able to develop our board first. And unless you can reset the tempo, reset the board state, we're always going to be the one dictating the pace of the game. I talk about this quite a bit in, you know, anything, any games that I play, right? Especially with card games, it matters so much. Um, and this is a, a principle that carries over from Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, so, so importantly, right? We know how powerful going first in that game is. But we're going to drop Tinkerbell, deal 2 damage to everything on board. We're going to use Bogo, Beast, and Diablo to take out the RLS. Use Robin Hood to take out Daisy, because that's another 2 damage for a total of 4. And we're going to leave the Rapunzel up with the Tinkerbell readied. Now, if the opponent opts to try to heal the Rapunzel with another Rapunzel, we're going to draw. If they exert anything, the Tinkerbell is going to go massive here and trade. We still have Bogo that they have to deal with, which means that if they don't out the Bogo, so they can't really quest, any other additional Floodborns we play are going to just continue to damage their board, which is very annoying for them. Uh, and we just have enough power on board you know, them still being two turns away from be prepared or a turn by now, right? This turn and the next turn. That any locations that they attempt to develop being a location heavy deck is likely just going to get outed by the overwhelming strength that we have on board. So they end up dropping a Goofy and uh, an Underworld here for a total of six ink. The Rapunzel has to tra trade into the Bogo. Well, well, the Rapunzel lives, but the Rapunzel now has four damage on it. Uh, the, the Goofy has two. And we're just looking like we're in a good spot here right um again my opponent is, is is pretty good so i wasn't really able to showcase the sneaky sleuth in this matchup because i just didn't have an opportunity to play it um uh, despite these being more casual decks you know it, it's you can see these these really come down to the interactive decision making um that we constantly have to evaluate because if i leave this stuff on my up on my opponent's side while it's nice to have damaged characters on their board to gain the extra lore like i just have to deal with their stuff we crash Rapunzel in, or we crash Tinkerbell into the Rapunzel, deal two damage to the Goofy to wipe out the opponent's board. Um, we're going to use Diablo and Beast to deal five damage to the Underworld, which is going to put it in Baboom range, which you can argue is not great. I could have played the Robin Bow item and just damaged it for the last point of damage and, and won the game that way. But I guess we wanted to develop this Robin Hood and the Ursula Deceiver of All. And again, a slight misplay by me because I could have played this Robin Hood and gained a lore with the damaged characters on board instead of playing it after I outed the damaged characters, but it's fine, I guess. My opponent just draws and realizes, yeah, it's game over. Um, I can't come back right now. So they made a good effort, but this just goes again to show you how powerful 
being on the play is. If I lost a die roll, I'm pretty sure my opponent would have taken it two to one. Um, and that's why you need to play meta if you really want to be super competitive. But that's going to wrap up this video, guys. If you made it this far to the end, let me know in the comment section below. And also comment on what else you want to see. Thank you again for watching, though. Quantum is out.